Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar takes aim at Pakistan and China at SEO, says terrorism undermines connectivity efforts. India slams Pakistan at UN, exposes sham democracy and state-sponsored terrorism. And Pakistan's financial capital Karachi struggles under economic pressure. India's External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar delivered a sharp message at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Conclave in Islamabad, confronting Pakistan and China over their destabilizing actions. On his first visit to Pakistan in nine years, Jay Shankar emphasized the need to combat terrorism, extremism and separatism, indirectly calling out Pakistan's use of militant proxies. He also insisted that trade and connectivity projects must respect territorial integrity, an implicit critique of China's Belt and Road Initiative passing through Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. With tensions high, Jay Shankar's speech made it clear that India will neither tolerate Pakistan's support for terrorism nor China's expansionism. Here's more on the story. India's External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar's arrival in Islamabad, his first in nearly a decade, comes at a time when Pakistan's global reputation continues to suffer due to its deep-rooted links with terrorism. While the meeting was officially convened to discuss regional cooperation under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization framework, Jay Shankar's speech left little room for diplomatic niceties. He emphasized that three evils, terrorism, extremism and separatism, must be tackled jointly, a pointed reference to Pakistan's ongoing use of terror groups such as Jaish-e Mohammed and Lashkar-e-Toiba against India. Despite Pakistan's repeated denials, evidence of its state-sponsored terrorism has been laid bare on international platforms. Jay Shankar's message highlighted India's anger with Islamabad's duplicity, pretending to cooperate on counter-terrorism efforts while nurturing militant networks that target Indian interests. Pakistan's Prime Minister, Shehbaz Sharif, who delivered the inaugural address at the summit, avoided addressing these accusations directly, further exposing the lack of accountability from Islamabad. No, I think that's an old Indian position that talks and terror cannot go uh, together. Uh, and I think he had made it very clear that he's going to Pakistan not for bilateral talks. Uh, he's going to a multilateral forum. Uh, and uh, and uh, that is exactly what, uh, you know, he stuck to his guns on that. So I think uh, it is important that he went, uh, delivered whatever message he had to deliver uh, and it, to use his own words that he is a well-behaved person. So uh, he uh, stayed within uh, the parameters of uh, diplomatic niceties uh, and yet uh, conveyed whatever message had to be conveyed. Jay Shankar's remarks were not limited to Pakistan. He also took aim at China's Belt and Road Initiative, warning that trade and connectivity projects must respect sovereignty and territorial integrity. This was a clear rejection of China's controversial infrastructure projects passing through POJK territory that legally belongs to India. India has consistently opposed these projects, viewing them as both an economic and strategic encroachment by Beijing. The SEO summit comes at a time when India and China remain locked in a tense military standoff in eastern Ladakh. Since 2020, Chinese troops have tried to alter the status quo along the line of actual control LAC, further straining relations between the two countries. Jay Shankar's speech underscored that India will not back down in the face of Chinese aggression whether in the Himalayas or the Indian Ocean, where Beijing continues to expand its naval presence. 
what he said is unexceptionable uh, in fact uh, it's it's uh, it's as clear as daylight that you cannot uh, you cannot have any progress unless you have peace and trust between all the member states or neighbors for that matter you want to have connectivity how can you have connectivity when there is one country uh, which is trying to impose war on you uh, or is coveting your territory another country that is exporting terrorism into your country and also coveting a part of your territory uh, how do you have any kind of uh, trade or understanding or development or connectivity with uh, such a country uh, you cannot have cooperation with a country which is promoting terrorism in your country so i think what the eam says uh, is uh, is uh, is almost a truism Uh, you know there is nothing more that needs to be said after this the seo conclave provided a rare diplomatic platform for india pakistan and china to engage though tensions between these countries remain unresolved india's participation highlighted a dual strategy engaging through multilateral forums while firmly standing against pakistan's terror networks and china's expansionism Jay Shankar's presence in Islamabad was a stark reminder to Pakistan that international isolation will continue unless it dismantles its terror infrastructure. His criticism of connectivity initiatives that violate sovereignty was a clear warning to China, signaling that India will resist Beijing's hegemonic ambitions in South Asia. Pakistan's anti-terrorism measures remain largely performative, often timed to avoid financial blacklists from the financial action task force meanwhile china continues to protect pakistan from global scrutiny vetoing efforts to blacklist terrorists like masood azhar however india has made it clear that such alliances will not deter it from defending its sovereignty and security interests India formally countered Pakistan's false claims over Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh at the United Nations with Indian diplomat Eldos Matthew Panous accusing Islamabad of interfering in India's affairs while ignoring its domestic turmoil. He highlighted the success of democratic elections in Kashmir, contrasting it with Pakistan's flawed military controlled polls. Panous also called out Pakistan's persecution of minorities and reliance on terrorism listing attacks orchestrated from its soil india's response exposed pakistan's hypocrisy and growing global isolation a report india would like to reiterate that jammu and kashmir and ladakh are where and will be an integral and inalienable part of india at the united nations India hit back hard at Pakistan dismantling its baseless claims about the union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh Councillor Eldos Matthew Punnus didn't hold back accusing Islamabad of meddling in India's internal affairs while ignoring the mess within its own borders Pakistan's permanent representative Munir Akram had labeled the recent Kashmir elections a sham at the UN Special Political and Decolonization Committee but Punnus dismissed these allegations as a case of the pot calling the kettle black speaking at the General Assembly's Special Political and Decolonization Committee Punnus ripped through Islamabad's narrative accusing it of hypocrisy and interference it is ironic that a country which is infamous across the globe for state sponsored terrorism and transnational crimes cast aspersions on the world's largest democracy it has been pakistan's consistent state policy to employ cross border terrorism as a weapon against its neighbors india showcased the success of recent elections in jammu and kashmir held under the framework of the indian constitution where more than 6 million voters exercise their democratic right in contrast 
Pakistan's elections in February 2024 were anything but democratic. Former Prime Minister Imran Khan, along with many of his allies, was imprisoned or disqualified. Violence marred the campaign, with the military exerting complete control over the process. Cell phone services were cut off to block voter mobilization, and independent media faced censorship. Given their tainted democratic record, Pakistan considers real democratic exercises as sham, as reflected in their statement. All countries speak from their experience. Sham elections, incarceration of opposition leaders, and suppression of political voices are what Pakistan is familiar with. It is natural that Pakistan must be disappointed to see real democracy at work. It was only last week that election results were announced in Jammu and Kashmir. Millions of voters in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir have spoken. They exercised their right to vote and have chosen their leadership according to the constitutional framework and you know, universal adult suffrage. Clearly, these terms must be alien to Pakistan. Hunuz also tore into the Pakistan's abysmal human rights record, highlighting abuses in Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. He accused Islamabad of using brutal crackdowns to suppress dissent in the region. Activists, journalists and ethnic minorities are routinely harassed, imprisoned or tortured. Religious minorities in Pakistan, Hindus, Christians, Sikhs and Ahmadis face severe persecution. Forced conversions of minority girls remain rampant in Sindh and Punjab with no intervention from law enforcement. Meanwhile, attacks on places of worship continue unchecked, reflecting the deeply rooted intolerance in Pakistani society. India also exposed Pakistan's continued reliance on cross-border terrorism, listing the numerous attacks orchestrated from Pakistani soil. These include the 2001 parliament attack, the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks and repeated attacks on civilian markets and pilgrimage routes. The list of attacks orchestrated by Pakistan is indeed long. In India, they have targeted our parliament, marketplaces and pilgrimage, pilgrimage routes among several others. Normal Indian citizens have been victims of such dastardly and inhumane acts by Pakistan. Religious and ethnic minorities and their places of worship are targeted and vandalized on a regular basis. It is important for Pakistan to first look inwards and set own house in order instead of meddling in the internal affairs of neighboring countries. Pakistan's obsession with India and their past practice corroborate that they will continue to use this August forum for spreading their malicious propaganda against my country. Pakistan has also been under international scrutiny for financing terrorist groups. Despite repeated warnings, the country continues to provide safe havens to extremist outfits like Lashkar-e-Taiba and Jaish Muhammad, earning it a spot on the Financial Action Task Force released multiple times. Pakistan's crumbling democracy, marked by military control and repression of political dissent, has not only isolated it internationally, but also shattered its credibility at the UN. As Islamabad continues to meddle in the affairs of neighboring countries, it faces growing criticism from the global community for failing to address its own domestic crisis. Pakistan remains under intense global scrutiny for its links with terrorism with mounting evidence pointing to its involvement in harboring and supporting terror groups. One of the most dangerous of these outfits is jaish e Mohammed, a Pakistan-based terrorist group responsible for deadly terror attacks in India. jaish -e's actions not only threaten regional stability, but also raise serious questions about Islamabad's commitment to counter-terrorism efforts.
a new book, Inside the Terrifying World of Jaish e Mohammed, by Dr. Abhinav Pandya, founder and CEO of Usna's Foundation, offers a well researched examination of the group's origins, evolution, and operational methods. Here's more on Jaish's role in terrorism and Pakistan's troubling connections. Jaish e Mohammed, led by Masood Azhar, is among Pakistan's most dangerous terror outfits. It has orchestrated several high profile attacks, including the 2001 parliament attack in New Delhi and the 2019 Pulwama bombing, which killed 40 paramilitary personnel. Founded in 2000, the organization enjoys active support from Pakistan's inter services intelligence enabling it to orchestrate large-scale operations across the border with precision. Dr. Abhinav Pandya's latest book, Inside the Terrifying World of Jaish Muhammad, takes readers on a deep dive into the group's origins, evolution, and operational methods. Based on rigorous field research in Kashmir, Pandya interviewed former JEM militants, security professionals, and intelligence experts to uncover the inner workings of the organization. The book details JEM's recruitment and indoctrination techniques, its training program for suicide missions, known as Fidain missions, and the financial networks that keep the group operational. Pandya's research also highlights future threats posed by JEM, making it essential reading for both security experts and concerned citizens. This book is about uh, this terrorist organization, Jaish e Mohammed, and um, this is uh, by far the most lethal and dangerous terror group for India, uh, comparable to Lashkar e Taiba. But the most unique part um, about this organization is that uh, Jaish has brought India and Pakistan twice on the verge of a full fledged war. First in 2001, when they attacked the Indian parliament. And second in Pulwama attack in the uh, in 2019 when uh, they killed like 40 Indian soldiers in the Fidain attack in Pulwama. After which we had Balakot strikes and all. And then Jash specializes in Fidain attacks, so it's a master of Fidain attacks. You know, and so I thought that you know I mean this uh, organization uh, uh, has not received much attention in the academic world and the think tank world. And that was also a speciality of this organization that it could keep itself off the radar because they are very low profile in terms of their conduct and activities, uh, unlike other groups like Lashkar and HM. So I thought that this is a, a subject worth writing because I guess our security agencies and all they need to know about it. JM's ability to operate with impunity reflects Pakistan's long-standing policy of using terrorism as a strategic tool. Over the years, JM has evolved into more than just an anti-India group. Its operations now extend across Afghanistan, Kashmir and beyond, further destabilizing the region. Intelligence agencies in India have repeatedly presented evidence of ISI's direct involvement in funding, arming and providing safe havens to the group. The connections between JEM and other terror outfits such as Lashkar-e-Taiba and the Haqqani network further complicate Pakistan's role in regional security. Both groups like JEM have received backing from the ISI and are frequently used as proxies. In fact, these groups are often involved in coordinated operations targeting Indian military installations such as the Pathankot Air Base attack in 2016. It is uh, uh, tied to Pakistani establishment with an umbilical cord. Like okay, so, it's very intensely supported by Pakistan. In fact, ISI was the one ISI who staged uh, this Masood Azhar's release attempt. Initially, they made four attempts in India, and then after that, when they failed, they uh, orchestrated this IC814 hijacking. Uh, when Masood was released, uh, they were he was, he was warmly received in Afghanistan, and then he was paraded as a hero in Pakistan. Then he started Jaish e Mohammed, and uh, so Masood Azhar his, and his family controls the this whole uh, organization and ISI supports them in many ways in, in, in terms of funding and you know, in terms of protecting their assets in terms of you know logistics training so uh, definitely they are very strong connections. Despite being labeled a global terrorist organization by the United Nations, JEM's leadership remains at large. Masood Azhar, its elusive founder, 
is suspected to be frequently relocated within Pakistan to avoid international scrutiny. Pakistan's anti-terror crackdowns, experts say, often appear to be cosmetic, time to coincide with international summits or to avoid backlisting by the Financial Action Task Force. India has repeatedly raised concerns about Pakistan's complicity on global platforms, demanding the dismantling of terrorist networks operating from its soil. However, these demands have yielded little change with groups like JM still operational. Dr. Pandya's book warns that the threat from Jaish Muhammad is far from over. JM's training programs and indoctrination methods remain active and the group's collaboration with other extremist outfits only increases the risk of future attacks. Economic reforms in Pakistan are tightening their grip, forcing citizens to grapple with the worst inflation in decades. With the government promising ambitious reforms to the International Monetary Fund, the average Pakistani is paying a steep price. Basic necessities like food and electricity are slipping beyond reach and many are finding it impossible to survive. As Pakistan continues down this turbulent path, the question remains. Will these reforms stabilize the economy or push ordinary citizens further into despair? Pakistan's economy is spiraling downward, with inflation turning daily life survival into a challenge. Items like flour, cooking oil and vegetables, staples of any household, have become luxuries. Despite government claims that reforms will bring long-term stability daily life for ordinary citizens is growing more unbearable. As part of its agreement with the International Monetary Fund, Pakistan has committed to expanding its tax base. Media reports reveal that Islamabad aims to raise the tax to GDP ratio to 13.7% over the next three years by simplifying tax policies, removing exemptions and broadening taxation across sectors. However, while these reforms are framed as essential to economic recovery, they have inflicted severe pain on the population. The electricity crisis is compounding the misery. Widespread load shedding, lasting as long as 10 to 12 hours, has paralyzed daily life. Homes and businesses are struggling without power, while those fortunate enough to have electricity are receiving bills that exceed their monthly income. Citizens are forced to make agonizing choices, cut back on food to pay bills or sell household items to survive. हुक्मरान हमारे जो है इसी में पड़े हैं बंगलों में हैं अपने मजे कर रहे हैं और हम लोग जो है धक्के खा रहे हैं पेट भर के हमें रोटी नहीं मिलती है बड़ी मुश्किल का सामना है बिजली के बिल इतने महंगे आ रहे हैं सुई गैस का बिल इतना महंगा आता है कि हम अपने घर का सामान बेचकर बिजली के बिल अदा कर रहे हैं सुई गैस के बिल अदा कर रहे हैं ये कैसी हुकूमत है ये कैसा इंकलाब आया है कि गरीब आदमी को फांसी लग रही है under IMF pressure, Pakistan has implemented harsh austerity measures, cutting subsidies and raising taxes. These steps were intended to stabilize the economy, but they have only deepened the suffering of the working and middle classes. Meanwhile, the elite remain largely unaffected, shielded from the worst effects of the crisis. Although these tax reforms may help Pakistan secure IMF support, they are exerting a severe toll on ordinary citizens. Inflation continues to climb and government intervention to control market prices is more urgent than ever. Without relief, the risk of widespread social unrest is looming.
And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.